And Greg has already got his slides ready to go for us. Thank you very much for that. Um, Greg is uh, the CEO and co-founder of Synergize, a geospatial company from Slovenia that you may all know for uh, the Sentinel Hub and the EO browser. And several years ago, they recognized the potential to open EO data that hit a wall trying to use the existing technologies to work with these large data sets. So fast forward a few, a few years and Sentinel Hub is now processing more than half a billion of requests every month, powering thousands of applications and machine learning workflows worldwide and providing seamless access to Planet, Sentinel, Landsat, and many other satellite missions. So today, Grega is going to talk to us about Global Earth Monitor. And Grega, I hand over to you from here. Thank you, Margaret. Can you just confirm that you can see my slides and hear me? Yes, excellent. OK, thank you very much. So hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, I'm Grega, and I'll be talking about the Global Earth Monitor which is a um, Horizon 2020 program, which started a bit less than a year ago, and uh, where we are actually trying to uh, find methods and uh, tools to uh, allow for the continuous monitoring of the really, really large areas. Now, um, we started a, a, bit than, uh, a bit less than a year ago, but we didn't start from scratch. Um, as mentioned, uh, as Margaret mentioned, we uh, already had developed the Sentinel Hub previously, actually also as a part of uh, similar projects. Uh, which simply allows a seamless access to the satellite data to be integrated in any kind of uh, machine learning workflows or web GIS application and so on, uh, and produces more or less uh, any kind of analysis-ready data form that people need uh, for their processes. Um, the, the data that uh, is accessible through Sentinel Hub are more or less all the uh, relevant open collections, Sentinel, Landsat, Modis, and the like, as well as the um, most known commercial providers. Um, in addition to Sentinel Hub, uh, then there is also the EO browser, which simply allows anyone to come to his favorite uh, area in the world, check for the latest available imagery, go back in time for a few months or maybe a few decades, uh, then uh, does some level of processing in order to extract the information that uh, they're interested in. And then um, they can simply observe how our planet is changing through time. And there are quite a few people doing that, like observing the planet. Uh, and I'm finding quite a lot of things. Unfortunately, many of these are uh, bad things like wildfires and, and hurricanes and so on. But every now and then there's also some fun or cool thing like uh, finding penguins via uh, finding their poop in an Antarctica or this guy who used your browser to uh, find the missing hiker uh, who sent this photo of his hairy legs. Um, and then this guy was able to geolocate him and basically send the rescue team there and possibly save his life. Now, um, we, so, uh, we, we made available the access to the data and that's fine, but there are simply not enough people to look at all this data, which is why we started to work in extract, automatically extracting information uh, from satellite images um, in order to simply do it faster uh, um, and automatically. Um, but uh, we soon realized that this is uh, much more complicated than the theory uh, tells us. So we um, ventured into it in a systematic manner, first starting uh, uh, to work on an open source Python stack called TioLearn, which kind of bridges the gap between the all well-known machine learning toolkits such as TensorFlow, MXNet and the like, and the complexity of multi-spectral and multi-temporal uh, satellite images. Uh, that don't fit in these uh, tools by itself. And people can come and simply configure all the steps needed to prepare their data in order to fit uh, into these technologies and basically execute the whole process there. Uh, we developed the cloud, uh, the, the cloud um, detection, uh, which seemed to be quite good, good enough that it's now part of the Google Earth engine uh, layers as well. And overall, the results of, of, the, of our work, so this was yet another project in the past, has been well, very well accepted by the community uh, who have like downloaded a ton of our um, uh, software stacks as well as read all the blog posts and so on. Now, this was the past. And uh, the, so when we started the, the Global Earth Monitor, we were thinking of, so what's the next step, right? And basically, what we want to do is to create a automatic monitoring uh, that would be uh, that would make it possible to monitor the whole Earth like on an ongoing basis, daily, ideally. And obviously, uh, this would need to be reusable. Would need to be um, 
uh, cost efficient. I think this is most important, right? You can already now uh, uh, process all the data in the world. The data is there, the, the tools are there, the cloud infrastructure allows you to spin thousands of virtual machines. So it's not that difficult to do, uh, but that's, it's expensive, right? And it's so expensive that it typically costs more than the value that it produces. So we really want to focus on the methods that would allow this to do it in an ongoing manner, systematically, and obviously would, uh, would not cost more than uh, uh, it's worthwhile. And as we are, um, uh, uh, we find the importance of sharing our work with the community so that we all learn and we all grow. Uh, we will also publish most of the work uh, in an open source license, um, probably in a kind of a EO Learn uh, next version of the EO Learn or, or simply an evolution of the EO, uh, EO Learn. So uh, what uh, we are working on, first of all, we are bringing quite some new data in the mix. Most importantly, the weather and climate data. Uh, we were always interested in uh, how getting this weather data in the models uh, would help to improve this. I mean, obviously, the weather is a very important factor of the changes uh, in the world, and uh, it, it should be obvious, I mean, uh, that these things are very much uh, um, uh, relevant. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are not that many models which do that for the moment. Then we are bringing uh, all most known uh, uh, machine learning methodologies uh, simply to, to have all the tools that one would need at place to, to do whatever model one uh, wants to do. And we are not doing this alone. So we have partners like Meteo Blue who are uh, well known for the weather data, uh, Toom, the experts in machine learning, uh, they are covering this part, TomTom, Tom, uh, again, the, the same for mapping, and then the European Union Satellite Center which is kind of a very demanding client who wants to use this data for some purpose. And I mean, this is an important point. We don't want to just do some theoretical model and so on. We, we want to demonstrate that this can be uh, used in the real life scenarios. Uh, so the use case I like most is this conflict pre-warning map, uh, which, uh, which will, is basically managed by Satsen. Uh, and what they try to do is to, uh, um, to model the, the um, migration patterns using the weather and the satellite data. I mean, it's a super complicated thing, but if it works well, it will contribute to the uh, security of uh, everyone on the world. Um, so uh, where did we get so far? I mean, it's a bit uh, less than a year since we started. Uh, we, we basically, um, immediately went into scaling up the things that we already had in place. So we did this land cover model, uh, which uh, was simple and well documented and everyone loved. And we just made it uh, uh, run it on the larger areas, more complicated areas. Uh, and while doing that, we noticed that there are some chunks of, of the process which are simply uh, very slow, very cost uh, um, costly and uh, tedious to maintain. And the, 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 specifically, I'm talking about the pre-processing of the data really to fit this, um, the, 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 the models. And this is why uh, we developed the batch processing, uh, which is um, uh, a part of the Sentinel Hub uh, uh, services now, which was basically being developed uh, to support the machine learning. So what one can do is uh, um, configure the algorithm that's needed to interpolate and harmonize the data in order to fit the, the modeling. And then uh, simply select an area of interest, which can be, I don't know, a whole region or even a whole world, uh, and the time period, and then run this. Uh, and what the batch processing will do is it will split the area into small chunks, like 10 by 10 kilometers. And then they will, uh, the, the, the batch processing will simply uh, run this code through all of these uh, uh, chunks and produce the features and output them in object storage so that, uh, they, can, uh, that they can be used further on in the processes. Um, as soon as we had this, we realized how much uh, this simplified the procedure because this part uh, that was uh, like on, in an ongoing manner, uh, asking for requests, checking whether things are okay, storing them and so on, is now basically run with a single command and you can immediately start uh, um, working on the, the training and the execution of the models. So uh, when we had this tool in place, we wanted to test it at some um, decent, uh, um, uh, decent level. So what we decided to do is to process uh, one, 18 months of the Sentinel-2 data globally uh, in order to produce the 10 daily, um, uh, 10 daily features uh, of all the bands. And uh, um, I mean, 
we, we stumbled uh, uh, upon some challenges, as you can see here. So these the red things are where the things are failing. Um, and the, um, and we were looking into why these things are failing, right? I mean, it didn't uh, it didn't cause too much of a problem. We still were able to simply rerun this a couple of times and we, we came through. But yeah, the things didn't go as, uh, as smooth as expected. And when we dived in, we noticed that uh, there is Amazon, like the all uh, almighty Amazon S3, that is basically throttling us, saying us uh, that we are uh, um, that we should slow down. That said, when we investigated further, we realized that uh, we are hitting 400,000 requests per second uh, to the um, S3 bucket. So, I mean, maybe we, sh we shouldn't be too, too mad uh, to Amazon because, I mean, it is quite an impressive feat to be able to support this level of, of requests. I mean, these 400,000 were successful, right? So uh, we were asking for even more. Um, yeah, so this is the result of this processing. Uh, it's a 120 meter, 10 daily, um, uh, harmonized, as cloudless as possible uh, uh, um, data set. So this is just a visualization, but obviously um, the, the data are available as a, a reflectance. So anyone can come and use it and the data is available uh, as an open data uh, CC by license on Amazon and Creodias uh, available like through uh, uh, through the internet. Um, and people liked it quite a bit, it's cloud optimized So we did everything possible to make it as, uh, um, as easy as, uh, as, uh, as possible. So anyway, uh, the one might ask, why did we do a 120 meter mosaic, right? I mean, why not 10 meter one? I mean, one reason is obvious, the cost, it's cheaper to process at 120 uh, meter than 10 meter. But this goes also the other way, right? I mean, if you have a lower scale uh, data set, you can then run your models uh, much more efficiently, like orders of magnitude more efficiently. Um, and our idea was that um, let's try to develop the models which will work on the low scales so that they can be run really um, efficiently uh, on a daily basis, maybe even with, I don't know, Sentinel-3 or Modis data, which are, uh, um, which are daily as well then identify the relevant areas of interest so that uh, um, people can, uh, sorry, so that the program can uh, see, ah, this is something that I'm interested in, then dive deeper in uh, to, to, to use the higher resolution data, uh, maybe even going to the um, VHR. And if the VHR is not available, maybe even queue the satellite to basically get the most recent data. So that's our idea because this is how we believe that it could really work on a, a global scale uh, on an ongoing basis, because then you reduce the cost by yeah, orders of magnitude. Um, now, uh, as soon as we, we published our thoughts, uh, um, yeah, there were uh, people uh, on the Twitter kind of uh, uh, looking at this pessimistically, kind of, uh, I mean, we don't think this will work. You know, you always have these people. And then uh, uh, there was a heated debate, uh, as the Twitter usually does, uh, with lots of comments and so on and so on. I mean, it was a positive one. Uh, but guess what? The, guess what? The, this person was right, right? I mean, it is really, really challenging uh, to work with 120 meter because there are so many features, uh, landscape features, uh, um, uh, um, part of one 100 by 100 meter pixel, right? Uh, and there is no best practice in how to handle this efficiently. So uh, we wanted to explore this uh, further. And to do it, we, we, we took the um, label data uh, to be as like accurate as possible, the, the label data, which were a sub-meter resolution. Uh, and then we try to simulate what's happening. And the first thing that uh, we tried is say, taking, uh, simply grieving this data to 120 meter grid, and then taking a majority vote, right? The, the class that was represented as a major one uh, was representing the whole pixel. And uh, high level, uh, everything looks fine. Then when you zoom in, you immediately see the, uh, the challenges of this approach. I mean, the um, land classes that are, uh, that are often, it will work perfectly fine, but those that are like underrepresented will probably disappear. I mean, here you see that the water is disappearing, the, sh the shrubs are disappearing, and the forests and the uh, grasslands are growing. So, um, so, so it's a challenge. Uh, if you look at it statistically, and if you compare like the original data and the um, majority voting data, it's not such a significant difference overall again. But if you look at the, these classes that are um, underrepresented, like artificial surface and shrubland, you see that like, a, a major chunk of it is disappearing. So 
this really is an issue. So then we said, okay, so um, let's uh, let's try not to confuse the machine learning model, and let's try to just use the pure pixels, those that are fully covered with a specific uh, um, specific land class, and then simply train the model on that, and uh, the results will will be good. But what happens is that if you do that, uh, you end up with uh, quite an empty map, right? I mean. Uh, this is what remains more or less just forest and some urban land and some chunks here and there. Uh, most of the features actually disappear. So it's really, really challenging. Uh, if, again, you look at this uh, um, a bit more systematically and you see that if we take a 100% purity, yeah, more or less just the forest remains. Then the lesser the threshold we set, the more of the other uh, um, classes will, will, will put in as well. But then obviously it will be more and more mixed pixel. Uh, another way to look at it, um, I, if you have the, uh, in this case, artificial surface, this one left, uh, if we say, look, 1% uh, of, uh, of the pixel artificial surface and we show it, we see that there is a ton of it. Uh, as soon as you go to 50%, the middle one, uh, you already um, are uh, losing majority of it. And if you go to 1%, uh, there is practically, uh, sorry, 100%, there is practically no, uh, none remaining. So that really doesn't work well with the small classes. Uh, so what we did is that we used the majority class uh, rasterization uh, and we run it on uh, our model in Slovenia, which is what we typically use to simply compare things. And we got the 80% accuracy, which is not bad, right? Uh, but obviously this is the, the accuracy uh, when you uh, look at it from the whole uh, uh, of area. And, but if you look at the specific land classes, the accuracy is way, uh, is way lower. Um, some examples of how, how this looks like. I mean, on the left side, the prediction, this is the ground truth. Again, rasterized to the same resolution. And this is to have an idea of, of the, the image that we are working on, right? So it's, it's, it's really a challenge. Um, I mean, if you look at some other examples, you see that things are working. I mean, it's not it's useless, but uh, yeah, it's difficult. Um, so then uh, uh, another thing that uh, we wanted to try it is how the model that you um, set up uh, at some area at time, how does it translate into other areas and other temporal periods? Um, because again, uh, when you are doing something on a global scale, you will never have data everywhere. And for all the, 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 the dates, you will always have to relay uh, um, um, depend on the, on the data from the past and so on. So um, on the left side, we have the, the data uh, the trained on 2019 and run on 2019, and the same model uh, trained on 2019 and run on 2020. And you see that there is not much of a difference, right? I mean, the, the model worked pretty well uh, across at least across one year period. And even if you compare it to ground truth, it's, it's quite OK. So then uh, we did a spatial transfer. So we trained the model in Slovenia, and we used it in uh, France. Um, to see how it works there. And again, looking high level, things work very well. Even you zoom in and you see um, some features where you really recognize that, yeah, that's, that's how it should be. And I mean, the best thing would be to end an experiment here and say, uh, that's it. Uh, but if you try harder and look further, you will see that it's not uh, as good as one seems. I mean, uh, it goes from bad to very bad, right? I mean, here you see uh, um, that most of the, um, arable land is represented as an uh, artificial surface. And the reason we believe is that uh, um, uh, there are features in France that are simply not uh, available in Slovenia at, uh, um, at such level. Like on the left side, you have the um, sand banks, uh, river sand banks, which we don't have many in Slovenia. And uh, we don't have so large uh, uh, arable areas either, right? And this uh, uh, confused the model, uh, apparently. So then what we tried is uh, trying to improve the model with some retraining uh, with, the, uh, with the local data. So we got uh, some data from France, like um, a small sample compared to what we had for Slovenia. And then we improved our model with that data. And you see, uh, so on the left side is like original model just trained on Slovenia. And the right side is the, the retrained one with France data. And you see that the model improved significantly. I mean, suddenly you see the river, you see that it's not uh, um, as noisy as pre before. So things really are picking up. And uh, we got quite decent results in this respect. Uh, another, uh, uh, another example, so on the left side, uh, without retraining, on the right side, uh, uh, with retraining. And this is 
the model that was run uh, with friends data, uh, large labels, uh, 20 meter resolution, and you see that uh, these two are quite a bit similar, uh, at least at this scale. So, the, so things work in general, uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely promising. But that's uh, still it is challenging. So uh, uh, Christoph was for sure right uh, when he said that uh, it will not work as simple as we expected. So uh, we try to do a similar thing with uh, um, detecting of urban areas as well, uh, detecting uh, buildings uh, with Sentinel-2, which, uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's quite difficult to do. Then going down to the spot uh, uh, with um, 1.5 meter pan sharpened resolution, and the results are way better. And obviously with Pleiades, uh, uh, even better. So again, trying to do these multi-scale uh, models, that, that's something that we are working on. Um, so. Uh, then we uh, uh, we put a lot of effort into um, uh, monitoring of agriculture for a simple reason that agriculture in Europe is uh, super important and you have uh, um, a strong uh, common agriculture policy. So there is uh, a lot of control involved with it. And we de de developed the generic markers, which kind of uh, identify what kind of agriculture activity is happening so that then you can translate this uh, in a basically monitoring of a spe specific plot. So we developed the uh, homogeneity marker, which tells whether a field is uh, just one crop or several of them, bare soil to see uh, to detect plowing and uh, harvesting, uh, mowing events. Uh, we did field delineation uh, so that we would be able to get the, the field boundaries when there are none or when there are bad ones. And one thing that we noticed is that as good as your models are, as good as your results are, they will be useless for the actual use case if you don't integrate this properly in a business process. Um, so we had to develop the uh, application, which allowed the, in this case, the, the, the governmental staff to, to check the results, to validate them, and then to basically uh, um, follow up on that. And similarly for uh, building detection, we did uh, another tool. This one is for Azerbaijan where um, the governmental officials, they go through newly identified buildings and simply validate whether they look okay in terms of the, the data. And then uh, they check them with the, the records to see whether they have permits and so on. And this then adds the value. So just the data, just the processing. Yeah, it's nice, but it doesn't add value. But when you integrate this in the business process, it works well. So I'll conclude here. Uh, I'll invite you to go to our website or follow us on Twitter and looking forward for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gregor. This is amazing, uh, getting into the nitty gritty of this balancing act between the, the costs, both in terms of data and, and actual uh, financial costs and that granularity, that level yeah. of high resolution detail. Um, quite a lot of things you've considered there. We've got, uh, we've got a question from the audience for you. Um, have you thought about simply separating out the land use classifications to eight or however many times the number of rasters per land use classification as a single float weight raster per land class? And uh, as an addendum to that, eight times the data, but you still retain the 1,444 times processing speed. Um, I mean, uh, we, we were looking into that as well, and uh, we, we haven't yet finished. Um, I, I mean, I don't have any specific results to share um, because we didn't get that far yet. Uh, we would still at the end want to have one model, right? So that's, that's a challenging thing. Um, so that the model would recognize these mixed classes as well. Uh, but it's definitely a way to go. Uh, and yeah, when we have the results, we'll for sure share, share them on our blog post. Fantastic, thank you. Let's see if there's any other questions for the audience. We are in that magical, beautiful spot of running ahead of schedule. Um, I'm going to quickly see if uh, Josep is actually still with us. I think he stepped out of the, the back end. He's now watching the conference from the, from the, the from Venulus. Um, just so that we realign with uh, the public schedule so that anybody that's wanting to join uh, exactly Nana's talk, or um, hopefully, Gregor, nobody's been joining us and missed the introduction of your talk to anybody that, that, um, that joined and missed your introduction to your topic. Um, I do understand that these are being recorded and shared later, so you will be able to catch that if you miss the intro. People need to to look for the whole session. I mean, look, that's the it's it's an event, so they shouldn't go for. You've got to be here for the whole session. Yes, but I've just checked with the organizers. We're running. Uh, we're actually running 15 minutes ahead of schedule, um, 
everybody's been beautifully organized. They were clearly giving us lots of buffer to have technical issues and it's been going very smoothly. So I'll wait for a sec, see if there's any other questions from the audience. Always a shame that we can't see each other in person and, and just wave. Um, you're getting lots of thanks from the audience for your talk, Rega. That, that was clearly a really enjoyable one. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are using it. In fact, there's another question for you. Um, did you also ag aggregate Sentinel-1 imagery to 120 meters like Sentinel-2? And is this available as a product in Sentinel Hub? Um, so it is available as a product in Sentinel Hub. We haven't yet uh, um, produced this kind of a global uh, um, collection. So, I mean, if somebody wants to use it, it's simply available through an API. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the moment, we were exploring quite a bit the um, relation of SAR data and optical data. And uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, our team didn't yet find this um, I don't know, silver bullet that will say, ah, here the radar really, really helps a lot. Um, so we are focusing very much to the optical simply because it has so many more information and because we haven't yet touched the areas which have a lot of clouds probably. So uh, we always were able to get a decent amount of optical data. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, whoever wants to use Sentinel-1 data, they can get a um, gamma knot, radiometrically corrected, speckle filter data through an API uh, with uh, one simple call. Great, thank you. I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions that have come in. We've got two channels for me to, to double check with here. Um, I think that I'll take this moment to give everybody a moment to get up, stretch your legs, refresh your, your cups of coffee or tea or water, um, use, the, use the restroom if you need to, and I will get um, Nana ready on stage with her slides, and we will dive into the second half of our our group on Earth observation session in a moment. I will put us on hold and I will see you at exactly half past. See you all again shortly. <laughs> 